I'm very happy to be back here in Warsaw. I was here two years ago and uh, did a talk then. Uh, again, I'm kind of baffled and uh, awed by the kind of size of screen I have behind me. This is not my everyday kind of screen, so this is impressive, I think. It kind of scares me every time. Is everybody having fun? You're learning something? Okay. Uh, I must admit, when I started my presentation here, I was thinking about doing this kind of Western theme. So I was thinking about coming in with a hat and guns and stuff like that. But uh, unfortunately, the airlines these days don't allow you to take guns anymore. So, okay, it's, it was, it's a problem. So I had to kind of change it a bit. But I've made my presentation called uh, The Stakeholders, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. I must admit to you guys, you know what, I'm not a technician. I don't know how to program anything like that. But what I do have is a bit of experience in working with large change uh, uh, initiatives, also small change initiatives. And I've had a lot of work to do with stakeholders. So I'm just going to try and give you a little bit of what I know and what I think is important. Okay, what I'll do first is I'll give you the year 101 on stakeholders, the two-slide crash course, everything you need to know. The first one is, of course, what is a stakeholder? Well, that's pretty simple. The stakeholder is anyone with a legitimate interest in what you're doing. And that can pretty much be anybody. Just don't forget that. The second thing is that a stakeholder is someone you really want to please, and you want to keep them informed. Pretty simple stuff. Again, I mean, this is the two-slide course. So this is how it's done. This is the kind of uh, recipe for success. Identify your stakeholders, simple. Analyze and group them, whatever method you use for that. It's pretty simple. Lots of good methods out there. You try to see things from their perspective, read their needs, and then you start trying to do something about them. This is very, very simple. The core principles here, and I believe they are in the Agile too, is pretty much you know, communicate and collaborate all the time. And the goal is, of course, a win-win for everybody. Super. It's easy peasy, as they say in English. This is super simple stuff. Except, oh, shit. Ooh, whoa, 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 whoa. This is artificial intelligence, by the way. It's just kind of rebooting the system because I'm full of crap now, okay? I'm sorry, guys. The thing is, in reality, stakeholder management is not easy. It's, in fact, very, 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 very tricky. There's nothing easy about it. I would like to call it the science of not ending up at the wrong end of the stake. Okay, so you have all these people out there, they're really ready to get you. They have all these nice interests, and they want to make sure you understand them and take care of them. There's this old English play where they say the following, uh, Hell hath no fury like a scorned woman. Well, I would say the same about stakeholders. Hell hath no fury like a scorned stakeholder. If you don't address them, if you don't understand them, if you don't read them, they will come back and they will really make hell for you. Okay. Saul Alcinski, is he known for everybody here? This is the guy who wrote uh, a book called uh, The Rules for Rebels. I think he put this very, very clearly. What he says here is, change means movement, movement means friction, friction means heat, and heat means controversy. This is pretty simple. Whenever you go into an organization, you start changing something, somebody will not necessarily like that change, and that will make conflict. And you get very quickly, in any larger organization or any complex system, you will get conflict of interest. And the main question everybody will be asking when you get in there is the following. And I mean, it's a worn phrase. Don't misunderstand me. What's in it for me? That's all they will be asking. And like I said in the beginning, they want you to be able to take care of their interests. They want you to be able to understand them. <sighs> this is a simple model of stakeholders. I have a stakeholder one on the one side and a stakeholder two on the other side. The stakeholder one can be a project leader, and he has some other task, and he wants to do something, and uh, he needs to change somebody, and they have some interests. So it's pretty much a give and take. I have something of value. It's going to cost you a little bit. 
I had a little extra work, or I mean, if this was in a business case, it would be, you know, I have a product, but I want your money. Okay, so you have this exchange. It's very, very simple. One-on-one, -on -one, no problem whatsoever. But what you see in organizations very often is in fact that you have many, many different stakeholders with many, many, many different interests. And you have to go in there and try and find out, okay, what are their interests? And do I have anything to exchange? Because believe me, if you don't have anything to give them, they won't necessarily be happy with your change or in your initiative. They will try and do something else. This is pretty much what I call uh, an organization. This is what you'll see as a chart on the business channel. <coughs> it's a nice concept. It's very clean, clear cut. You have some kind of CEO, you have a board somewhere. You have all these line organizations. They have their clear cut functions and stuff like that. I mean, if you're a project leader and you come into this, this is simple because everybody has its place. Everybody kind of has a function. And you read this and you say, okay, this is simple. Okay, if I want to do something about sales, I'll go there, that's okay. If I want to do something about finance, I'll go there and I'll do that. And they, they know what's going on. <sighs> if only the world was this simple. In my experience, this is more like an organization. Okay? There's a whole lot of stuff going on. So this clear cut thing we saw in the beginning, that's only what we want to show people. This is what I call the TV novella, not the business channel, this is a TV novella. You watch Spanish, kind of like these uh, nice, uh, funny uh, programs they have with all these intricate, different kind of connections between people, all the chaos and all the, the, uh, the conflict and everything like that. This is what organizations are like. You will have people that have been in the organization for a long time. They have their own standing, their own position. You can't kind of, Put that away. There are other people that come in that are new, that people might not like. There can even be stuff like love affairs, exes and stuff like that. And all that's mingled together in this organization, and that's also a layer in understanding the stakeholders and the complexity in these organizations. If I look at levels in an organization, Forrester did a bit of work on this to try and find out what are people's different kind of... Uh, major worries. And I've adapted this a little bit from Forrester, but in general, I would say the following. The problems, the stakes, if you want, at the top, look very different from the stakes at the bottom. So I have an organization where things are muddled about, and I also have these layers where people have completely different pictures of what's going on and their stakes. As a project lead in any major project, you're going to have to deal with both the muddliness of the organization and the levels and try and find out what can I do to help my stakeholders. Very often what happens is the different layers will go through, you, know, you have a proposal, some kind of change, and they will start doing this exercise. They will start putting up, what would the best outcome be and what would the worst outcome be for me? What can I get out of this and what will it cost me? I guess you guys have all been in some other change initiative. Oh, they're going to change the organization. The moment you hear that, you start thinking, okay, what does this mean for me? And you start making this kind of picture of, is this good for me or is this bad for me? You also do one more thing. You, I think at least a lot of people do this. They also do a quick risk assessment. So they kind of take their worries, their pros and cons, and they put in to kind of a risk assessment, how likely is something going to happen? When I go to an organization, I have this kind of project I'm going to do, and it's because we're going to improve work conditions. Uh, yeah, I have all these people sitting out there looking at me and saying, yeah, you're going to do some improvement here. How likely is it that this, in fact, is going to be an improvement? And how likely is it not going to be an improvement? It's going to make things worse for me. Maybe even I lose my job. And these are the kinds of things that are going through people's heads when you meet them as a stakeholder. So, out from whatever you say, and their position in the organization, or their historic standing in the organization, they will either say thumbs up or thumbs down. Some will sit on the fence. But most of them will either be pretty positive, or they'll be pretty negative to what you do. And from that, they start playing a game. Depending on what they bring to the playing field, that be, for example, power, 
or as I've put up here, maybe expertise, something an organization needs. Or even one of my examples here is a little black book. They have some of the kind of power they're going to exert into this mixture. And depending on their stake in the game, what kind of position they have, what kind of stake they have. And another important thing is their disposition towards conflict. To which degree do they really want to go into a fight? Uh, let me take an example here. Uh, if you end up in the high high here, it'll be somebody who is pretty interested in the thing and that sees that this would accommodate them. You'll be interested in kind of trying to find middle ground and find solutions. Uh, I worked a lot with uh, uh, unions. A union might be very different there because they can see things completely different. They'd be willing to fight a lot more unless you give them what they want. But from these things, they derive their kind of strategy. They find out how they want to play the game. And then you end up with this kind of thing. Okay? These are the players I, see, I say you can see. These are the ones that normally you will see around there. Okay? You will have on the positive side, the poor side, the change agents, the willing helpers, the sponsors that will be there and say, yeah, thumbs up, go, go, go. And you will have some guys that can be against. The bureaucrats, maybe they're saying, no, they've been sitting here in this organization for a long time. I don't really want to change anything. I'm not really a poor. You have the uh, cynic, somebody who's pretty much just pissed off in the organization and just wants to fire cheap shots at you and will do this of principle and just be on the against side because that's a good thing to do. Then he gets noticed. You can have the enemy. That is somebody that really is against you, that really is open and shows this. I do not like the change. And then you can have, of course, some fence sitters. Some people sitting there saying, I don't know which way I'm going to go, one way or the other. But then you have some players you might not see. And these are, for me at least, some of the ugly ones. Because they're, they can be very difficult to address. The two in the middle, the reporter, anybody who has a position where they accumulate and spread information, they might not even be interested in what's going on. And like I say, I've been working in some large-scale projects, and sometimes I'm looking reporters as such will try and pick up information and they will try to play a role in this and they can make life difficult for you. Uh, you also have the politicians as I call them, people that can have an interest in this simply because it's good for them to have a stake in it no matter if they're really interested in the case or not. I'll get back to that a little bit later on. Uh, then on the poor side you can have the fool, somebody who has good intentions and is really trying to help you but every time they do that, they mess up, and they mess up terribly for you. And you can also have what I call sleeping giants. Those are people that have formal power or formal, some other kind of uh, resource that you could need, but they're not really interested quite yet. But you just can't see them to begin with. They can be very invisible in the organization. And on the other side, I can have everything from the kind of the guild, you know, the secret brotherships in the organization that are doing their thing no matter what's going on. And they will continuously be there. They'll be making their own theories, their own strategies, and they'll be opposing. You won't see them, but they'll be there. You can have the saboteur. This is the guy that didn't really like what's going on. He seems to be helping you along and stuff like that, but what he's really doing is poking something in your wheels every, every day. So you get this friction. And you can even have a terrorist, somebody that's just waiting to pounce. Your slightest mistake, and he goes in and he hits you hard and kind of destroys everything you built up over the last weeks or months or whatever. So all these people here, I call kind of like ugly. I have a background from the literature said here, and uh, of course I had to read a lot of these guys that uh, were good thinkers. And amongst them was Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence. Everybody knows who this is? Yeah? Okay. T.E. Lawrence, uh, in my view, was one of the guys that really understood stakeholder management. He was put into a very, very difficult situation during the, during the First World War in uh, Arabia and had to try and find out who wants what. And there were loads of different stakeholders there. And what he pretty much says in Seven Pillars is the following. When I took a decision or adopted an alternative, it was always after studying many relevant and many irrelevant facts. His point was the following. If you're going in to do some kind of change, 
try to influence people, you first have to understand them. Every bit you can find out about them, you should try and understand. Okay, so if I go into an organization, I try and find out what's going on here. One of the first things I want to try and find out is the following. What are they really opposing? Okay. Uh, when I finished the military, I decided I wanted to try a couple of different things. And one of the things I always wanted to do was be a consultant. I had worked uh, in the armed forces for many, many years, also together with uh, consultants. And I knew how people saw consultants. Okay? They don't like you. Okay, so I have to start some and find out at what level don't they like me or my idea. So I was trying to find out first, okay, if you're going to fight me, is it because you don't like me as a person or what I do? Okay, I can get an answer to that. If they like me, okay, happy. Then I can go to the next level. And they're still opposing me, and I can ask them, okay, what's the next level? And they say, I don't like change. Oh, okay, and then you have to start discussing that bit. And then you can go from level to level. This is what's called the Anya model. It was made by a guy called Mike Clayton. He has a small little book called The, uh, the Handbook of Resistance, which I find is pretty interesting. These are kind of questions I think you should go through people with. Either start in the middle or start at the top, just try and find out at what level are people resisting me. Because depending on what level they're resisting you, you can employ different strategies to mitigate that resistance. If they're at the top there, I don't understand why we have to change. Well, if that's the case, what you have to do is you have to go and explain why. Then you have to go back to anybody who has given you the omission, the CEO or whoever put you in charge of a project, and find out why do we have to change. And you have to be very, very clear about that. I don't understand why this change. Well, okay, we've been through a whole lot of things. Explain to them all the different options you've been through and why you chose exactly this one. But also be open, listen. They might have better ideas. So you just go through this motion, try and find out at what level are, is, is the resistance really there. Another thing I learned, uh, I was sent off to Staff College once upon a time to take a course called Business Wargaming. Uh, we had this uh, professor called Professor Buckin, and he was trying to teach us, I mean, it was a fancy title, Business Wargaming. What it was really all about was decision and decision processes. And he got me to read a book called The Cuban Missile Crisis, The Essence of Decision. I had by that time been in the armed forces for somewhere around 18 to 20 years, and it always baffled me why when we were taking decisions, things that I thought were logical were not perceived as logical by the other parties. And in reading this book, Alison and Selikov described the following. If you're going to look at decision processes, or people stand in things, you have to understand the perspective they have. So as a problem solver, I usually came in with a rational perspective. One plus one is two. Very simple. And I had logical kind of uh, cause and effect things, and we built up stuff. Mathematical, empirical, you were very good at that. And you thought, OK, why doesn't other people see this logic? Well, the thing is that other people can see the same thing going on through a different lens. Some of them are what they call here the bureaucratic uh, uh, perspective. You can have people that either through a rule book or through what, how things have been earlier on, expect that the way to be done. So in a bureaucrat's book, uh, one plus one can become two and a half simply because you expect synergy, and that's kind of the rule, so you expect that. You also have a third perspective, which is the political perspective. Uh, and that's the scary one, I also think, because uh, anybody who sees an interest in what you're doing, not necessarily because of what you're doing, but because it can, in fact, give them influence in other areas, they will join in and they will try to exert their power, not necessarily because they're interested in what you're doing, but because they want to do it somewhere else. What I learned from this is the following. You know, if you're going in, the onion levels is one thing, but the other one is find out what kind of perspectives you can see this change from. And these are only three of them that are in the book. But I've seen later, uh, I've experienced myself, there can be very many other perspectives to see things in than my perspective. One more thing I've experienced uh, is the following. You start a project, you get a whole bunch of stakeholders on board, and they can be thumbs up or thumbs down. Right? And you think you've analyzed them. 
And then uh, the project keeps going. You have week two, week three, week four. And the guys you thought were your friends all of a sudden turn out to be irritated at you. Why? Well, when you do change, you start tweaking different things, and you're interacting with all these stakeholders, and you're giving some of them something, and you're taking away something from some of them. And sometimes you forget that if you take something from somebody, if, if you give something to somebody, sorry, you might in fact be hurting somebody else. So you have to do the stakeholder analysis all the time. And I think in Agile or in any method where you're doing incremental development, this is even more important because you're changing things all the time. In simple changes, where you have few stakeholders, it's pretty easy. In big change initiatives, it can be a lot more difficult because you have a lot more stakeholders. <sighs> One other thing I've experienced is that uh, generally, we most probably are too quick at deciding what is good for other people. We're not very good at listening. Uh, William Isaacs wrote a book once upon a time called Dialogue, the Dialogue of uh, uh, Thinking Together. And in this book, what he describes is the following. Every time you start a conversation, he calls this turning together, okay? So you gather your stakeholders and you turn together. You start looking the stakeholder in the eye, start talking to them. At that point in time, I have a decision point, the deliberation. Which way do I go? And because many of us, at least, when we have kind of like the, uh, the goal for the project, what we're doing or whatever, and we have kind of part solutions, we can very quickly end up going towards what I call defend or ward off. That is, you go in, we have a solution. We just want to sell the solution. If I go in that direction, I have, again, a decision point. I can either decide to go into what's called the skillful conversation, which is pretty much I lay all my facts on the table, you lay all the facts on the table, and then we weigh this up and we kind of find a solution. Or I can, in fact, be so locked on my position, what I think is correct, that I go into what is called controlled discussion and debate. And the only thing I'm going to do there is kind of say, you're wrong and I'm right. You're wrong, I'm right. And you just want to push this through. I'm not saying that those are not methods you shouldn't use, because sometimes you have to use them. When I was uh, taught uh, leadership, we were taught something called uh, situational leadership. Uh, if I have time, I can take time to do the high road here, which is, of course, then instead, suspend, listen, really use time, really trying to find out what they mean, start building new models together, finding out what the possibilities are. But this takes time, OK? So in situational leadership, if I have the time, I do that. But sometimes, if you're pressed on time and so on, you might have to choose one of the lower ones. But do be aware, like I said, Hell hath no fury like a scorned stakeholder. So the moment you go down towards the bottom here, you're definitely going to get somebody angry at some other point in time. Last thing here I'm going to put up here as an idea is uh, from a book called uh, Confrontal, uh, Confrontal uh, Analysis by Nigel Howard. It's written for people that do... Uh, uh, conflict work in uh, real conflicts, that is, people shooting each other. But I think this model is pretty good. What he says is that uh, when you have a conflict, you have this scene set up, okay? So you start identifying the parties and you start finding out who they are and stuff like that. And you also find out that they have differences of opinion. And then you have this build-up. You meet, you start kind of exchanging your ideas and stuff like that. And hopefully, you go to a kind of a, uh, if you're very good at this, then you find out a way to solve this. So you go into resolution and the conflict solved. You just implement it. But sometimes you won't be able to do that. And then you have to go into what he calls climax. <coughs> and what I want to do is try and, you know, every time I find out that somebody totally disagrees with me, it's just trying to go through iterations enough time. Okay, I go into this conflict, this climax thing, I work with it a bit. Instead of going right into full conflict, take a new step back again. Look at the build-up once more. And if you're in the position that you are uh, capable of it, try and do that as many times as possible. Because every time you go that loop once more, you get a chance, in fact, to resolve the situation. 
Remember the one about listening? This also means you may probably have to listen more carefully to find out what's really important, and you have to start understanding the other side. That's not always a given, you can't always do that. Good. When uh, I was prepared to go into uh, theory once upon a time as a military observer, I was on the border between Ethiopia and Eritrea, and uh, we had all this nice training up front. And uh, they sent us off to Finland. Our colleague here was from Finland here. And they sent me to a very nice school in Ninisalo. And uh, I think that was one of the places I learned a lot about uh, kind of stakeholder management in terms of uh, preparing for how to negotiate with stakeholders and find out what they need. And they made these small little pieces of paper that we could put in our pockets. I've rewritten it here for you, so I have two slides now that will kind of be my takeaway for you guys. Where I've tried to kind of uh, rephrase this in a civilian setting, and if you're good, you can uh, kind of copy this from the slides and then uh, maybe laminate it and put it in your pocket. And every time you know you're going to meet a stakeholder, just pull it out because that's what we did. We pulled them out and we had a look at them on both sides and we tried to find out have we done everything we can do. Uh, in Eritrea, we had two opposing parties that were in fact shooting each other, but we had lots of other kinds of stakeholders too. I had militias, I had civilian populations, I had NGOs, I had uh, officers from 40 different nations under my command, and I thought this was pretty good because you were, you were trying to kind of find common ground with stakeholders all the time. This side is pretty much just kind of like, okay, what steps do you have to go through? Preparation, information gathering. First part of information gathering for me is clarify your mission. Find out what are your boundaries, what is your authority. That's very important. Because if you step outside your boundary, you will be in trouble. Uh, second one, like I mentioned, is identify your stakeholders. Gather the information on them. Group prioritize. This is all, like I said, in Management 101. And then you start setting together a plan. Okay, what can I do with all this information? What is the best approach to these people? And at least if you're going into a difficult no negotiation with stakeholders, I would say try and keep it simple. Don't try and do too much at once. Pick out a few areas. I like to start with the ones that I think I can do something about, so you start gaining a common ground and understanding, and then you can go to the more difficult ones later on. I've also put in a couple of points here, just the execution, the follow-up. But I'll go to this slide instead here. Uh, these are just kind of things you can think about when you're going into a, a, a meeting with a stakeholder. Just remember the skills of an effective negotiator, mediator. There's some things you can think through there, at personality traits. But I think even more important is this identify interest thing. Uh, we used a lot of uh, acronyms in the uh, military. And the one is cheap. That is, when you meet somebody, try and read their concerns, their hopes, their expectations, their attitude, and not least their priorities. And then additionally, of course, try and find out what are their beliefs, what are their fears, and what are their values. Because if you can start understanding those things, you can start a meaningful discussion. Then you can go to a real dialogue because you're showing understanding for what they think and what they believe and what they do. Good. Uh, yeah, last thing. Oh, I forgot to mention that. Uh, on the bottom of the slide, there's something called BATNA. Best alternative to no agreement. Again, if you're going into negotiation with somebody, stakeholder, you're trying to uh, win them over, I would say, be very careful to push for, ultima, for, uh, for uh, kind of like uh, end states too early. Remember the thing uh, I had from the, uh, uh, with the, with the uh, conflict that I said you had to go loop and loop and loop again? The BATNA is pretty much that you try and up front find out how can I get out of the situation if we started to get deadlocked. Because the moment you're deadlocked, you have to put a lot more effort into kind of resolving the situation afterwards. So upfront thinking about what is the best alternative to no agreement or no understanding in that meeting, not only for you, but also for your opponent. 
In many cases, it's very, very, very important to make sure the stakeholder that's opposing you can save face. Because if they lose face, they will be even more deadlocked. So I hope that this can be of some help to you when you're out there with stakeholders. Like I say, uh, a lot of what I've been talking about today is in larger, more complex systems and complex uh, changes. But I think some of it can also be used uh, when the problems you're working with are smaller. Just reminders to things you have to go through. So I think I'll leave it at that.